Uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it, it is a great privilege uh, to be here uh, to represent the Society uh, from London uh, as the uh, President-elect uh, for next year. Um, it is your society as much as anybody's. It is part of a global environment, which of course aerospace is the leading exponent of where some of the future technology, some of the most skilled people, some of the highest risks, but some of the greatest rewards come from. And no matter what part of the aerospace environment you are, it is part of this society's job to bring that all together and to provide that environment in which those things can be exposed, explained, and most importantly, revealed to the youngsters who come along behind us to excite the excitement, but also the enjoyment of being involved in the aerospace environment. If we do nothing else, that is what we should do. But standing here uh, reminds me of, of being uh, a, a young uh, vicar uh, many, many years ago who was told to uh, address the assembled uh, Battle of Britain parade. And he was told to make the sermon uh, relevant uh, and, of course, uh, meaningful. So he went away and, uh, and prepared his sermon. He then stood up in the pulpit on the appropriate uh, Sunday uh, and began his sermon. Uh, and he proceeded for about 20 minutes, so not enough time to fall asleep. Uh, and I hope you're not going to fall asleep in the next 20 minutes while I uh, talk to you, but I will pardon the, the snoring if it does. It'll be from the back row, I'm sure. Um, and he stood there and talked about all the things you might expect of the Battle of Britain. Except, as the stage commander said to him afterwards, but you didn't talk about it, what it was like to be there. You didn't talk about what it felt about. You didn't talk about what the young men and women were exposed to, and most importantly, what their feelings were afterwards. And after a second of thought, the vicar said, well, I couldn't, sir, because, of course, I wasn't there. How could I possibly talk about those sort of things? I've no memory of them. I've no uh, understanding of them. And after a further minute, the station commander said, well, I'm really looking forward then to your sermons at Easter and Christmas. <laughs> it is, of course, uh, all about trying to put things in context, uh, and that is what I believe the society is trying to do today. It is trying to make sure that we look forward and not just back. Um, many of you will have had the chance, if not, it is still available, to uh, look at the Winkles uh, Brown uh, um, lecture that was given by Paul Beaver about 10 days ago uh, at the Society. It was one of those that should become the norm, I trust, and certainly I'll be working to make sure it is, that these lectures, these conferences, are online as soon as we possibly can, so that everybody can actually tune into them and listen and, be, uh, uh, and get the chance to hear what is being talked about and what is going on. It is part of where the society needs to go to make sure that we keep everyone informed, but why can we not make sure these things are live or at least immediately available as soon afterwards? And the answer is there is no reason, so I hope that is perhaps indicative of where we're going to go in trying to pass the message and get things across. But where and what is, the, is it that makes aviation so exciting? Well, I was extremely lucky, as I mentioned to someone before we started, to have been on one of the very early flights of Concorde when it came out of Filton. Good old 002 was built there, as were all the British Concords, and it used to fly out of Filton for about the first five or six flights and then moved to Fairford, where it continued the development and the experimental work. Well, on one of the early trips, we were from university involved in measuring the thermodynamics of the fuselage and how the 10-inch increase in the fuselage when it got up to Mach 2 um, was going to be sustained and uh, measured and to make sure, of course, that it was built in a way that could take those sort of pressures on and off for its life. Uh, in the aircraft at that stage, there were just six seats. Two guys at the front, uh, of course, who were in relative uh, luxury, relative luxury, and the rest of us in the back, four of us, for those who've flown in good old transport airplanes, parachute airplanes, you'll know that meant canvas-strapped seats uh, and pretty uncomfortable positions while we were there with a lot, a lot of technical equipment down the back of the airplane measuring everything you could possibly think of um, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the way we were gathering the data and the information. We went out over the Bay of Biscay. We went just supersonic uh, at that stage as they built up to their full clearance. 
and then um, we measured everything, came back, and went back to university to analyze what was going on. Well, I had been one of those young men who did not want to go to university. Uh, I was determined simply to go flying. And at the time, BOAC, BEA, as it was, had a training school at Hemble in Southampton. And they, uh, unfortunately, in 1972, decided they no longer needed to train ab initio pilots, uh, and therefore they just closed it down without much warning. Uh, fortunately, I'd also applied to the Royal Air Force, and they were still willing to, uh, to offer me a chance. The trouble was, when I then got to the door, they said, ah, young man, now about this university cadetship, what university cadetship, I said, it is the last thing I want to do on this planet. And they said, no, 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 for now, for Royal Air Force uh, officers in particular and pilots, we want you to go to university first. We'll teach you to fly at the university air squadrons while you're there, and then you can come into the Royal Air Force. So much against my every wish, off I went to university. What a fantastic decision that was by the Royal Air Force to send me to university. I had three fantastic years. I did some work, but we also had a great time, and they taught me to fly while I was there. My love of the technical side of aviation came from that three years, of seeing why we'd spent so much time doing mathematics and triangles and worrying about the temperatures of this and worrying about what happened there. Um, it was something that became so much more alive, so much more practicable at that stage that I really, really enjoyed it. And that, of course, has carried on through my career because of the importance of understanding why things happen in the air. Why do aeroplanes react in certain ways? Why do certain materials work and not? One of the most exciting developments I think that's going to happen in aviation in the next couple of years, actually within the next four months, is that a certain aeroplane will fly in May or June uh, this year um, from France to England. It will be five passengers and one pilot. It will be entirely powered by electricity, by batteries. It will fly across the channel to England. It'll fly for just under two hours. It'll then take about 45 minutes to recharge the batteries and to be ready to go again. That is going to revolutionize, in my view, general aviation. Because if that becomes the norm, the cost, the ability, the convenience, the environmental issues will all mean that all of a sudden there could be an enormous number of extra people willing and wanting to go into aviation and to get involved and to get to, uh, the ability to fly uh, in that sort of aircraft. That is going to change things. That's really exciting stuff. My question would be, are the airspace control measures in place to cope with that increase in volume? Are the airfields ready for that type of requirement for electricity to power airplanes? Have we thought this all through as to where this is going to take us? And another part of the forest, which I think, again, is something that's going to be important for society to really continue to keep embracing. The current president has majored this year on the question of remotely piloted aircraft, UAVs, that are coming along. Why has he done that? Because the commercial pressure to get these vehicles into use is growing by the day because the cost of using the vehicles for which these UAVs were replaced, helicopters, is extremely high by comparison. And the opportunity to have remotely piloted aircraft flown in controlled airspace over the top of sporting events, pop concerts, for those who still go, must be a few of you, and lots of other public events to be able to fulfill the requirement to see and provide information about what's going on, particularly for the TV companies, film companies and so forth, is growing. And they're ready to go. Again, I wonder whether the community, the environment of aerospace, is ready for the impact of this in terms of how it's going to be controlled and how it's going to safely operate. The technology is there, but have we thought through the consequences and how we're going to do it? Our society should be leading that thinking because it is a general subject of aerospace interest that is going to affect so many other types of users of airspace. We need to make sure we're ready to take that on board. So what about the youngsters who are developing so much of where aerospace is going to go in the future. Have we got the right skill sets being taught? Are there the right opportunities for them to understand what it's like to be in the air? If you're an operator of a UAV, let's take a military one for the moment, just out of uh, ease of, of comparison with years gone by, then of course at the moment, you're operating that vehicle with what? 
with a set of wings on your chest, having done some flying experience? Or just someone who sits in front of a screen with a joystick and is able to fly it around based on your ability to play games on the TV and on the computer? The answer needs to be thought through. The answer, you know, we decided in the Royal Air Force when I was there, needed a license, needed wings on your chest. Not the same wings as a pilot who spends his entire life in the aeroplane, but needed a wings because you needed a qualification, you needed recognition, and you needed the confidence and the ability to stand up in an air environment of the future and be able to demonstrate why it is, what you do, how competent you are, and where this is all gonna lead. Because these operators, these flyers, go under quite a lot of pressure. Let me give you a military uh, example here. Um, when we were operating the Reapers over Afghanistan, the operators were actually flying these uh, uh, vehicles from thousands and thousands of miles away from where they were actually flying. They were having to drive out into a very dark and dusty part of the desert in America and go into a cabin and about an hour and a half after they set off from where they were living, spend 10 to 12 hours in that cabin, flying those vehicles, operating them, often obviously uh, uh, um, uh, keeping track of things that were happening through the, 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 the cameras and so on board, but quite often having to drop weapons on targets that were out there. But let me give you the scenario that tells you how that actually worked. One uh, evening, uh, a crew were in the cabin flying a vehicle when they got the call that a young US Marine lieutenant with his 18 Marines I was in fear for their lives because they were being attacked. They were actually being attacked by a group of farmers and village people who'd been incited to go and attack this outpost because this outpost was stopping some of the uh, uh, Taliban from prosecuting their attacks because they were keeping track of them and watching them what they were doing. So they'd incited the villagers to go with their farm implements, with their spades, with their rakes, with whatever they'd got to attack these young Marines on the basis that they were um, uh, defiling the Quran and, and, and other typical uh, measures. So as they're going up the road, this poor lieutenant, lieutenant, uh, young lieutenant is wondering what on earth he's going to do. First of all, his rule book doesn't tell him what to do in this situation. Secondly, he doesn't feel he can tell his Marines to start opening fire effectively on uh, unarmed civilians, in, in, as much as they've not got uh, uh, conventional um, uh, rifles or machine guns or grenades or anything like that. So he decides to call in and in calling in, they alert the predator that's being flown by uh, 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 our people. It's moved over the top so that they can get eyes on and see what's going on. Sure enough, people are coming up the road. Long story short, at one point, they're actually attacking the compound, trying to get in to attack the, the Marines. The lieutenant is absolutely uh, distraught as to what to do, and he asks if there's any way they could drop a weapon that would explode to tell these people that actually go away. Of course, the rules of engagement, the legal basis on which they conduct that operation, said absolutely not, because that is not something you can do to unarmed civilians. That's not legal. So they had to say no. At which point, and I shan't use the words given the recording going on, the expletives coming out of the young lieutenant got slightly more uh, blue, shall I say, as to why or not and what was going to happen. Eventually, a way was found to use uh, the facility to warn off the people that there was something above that could do something nasty to them if they didn't stop doing what they were doing. But in the same moment, of course, you've got the young lieutenant wondering why this vehicle wouldn't drop a bomb to protect his men. You've got the legal side of the house making sure that if they had done, of course, then President Karzai, who was not beyond uh, explaining to people uh, why they shouldn't be in his country, despite the fact that we're supporting him and his regime, and you've got the young people inside that cabin mentally going through torture as to what they should do. But then they had to get out of that cabin, get back in the car, and drive an hour and a quarter back to where they were living. At which point, people normally say to me, well, where were they living? Well, the answer is they were living in Las Vegas. And people will say, oh, come on then, it can't be that hard. Missing the point that these youngsters flying those machines, going through mental, enormous mental stress from the point of view of leaving their families and so forth in Las Vegas, driving out, then having to make life and death decisions on those uh, situations, which they absolutely lived because they were there, they could see and hear everything, and then having to drive the long journey back through the desert. I often think people don't understand that actually operating these things is not anything like playing a computer game, 
they know it's real life and they go through enormous stress and enormous uh, courage to do what they do half the time. Now that's a vivid example. My point here to you, tonight to you is that these vehicles are here to stay. They are going to be part of our aviation community. And we need as our society to get in there and make sure that we are influential in how we combine these into live flying, uh, party flying, uh, and every other form of aviation activity because they're here and we can't ignore them. We should be leading that debate. Then there's the question, I think, of making sure that we have the right, um, the right understanding of how we can improve uh, the way in which aviation affects society. I mentioned the batteries. That's one example of where technology is changing. There are others in terms of biofuels and, and other ways as well. This is critical if we are to make sure that this society leads the way and talks up how we can do things differently and achieve an overall effect that we need to achieve. So we need to make sure that we understand what's going to happen uh, in the next 50 years, the next 50 months. The changes are going to be dramatic. By definition, they are going to be led by people's desire to want to keep flying. I saw a graph the other day that showed the number of airlines, the extra airlines, that are going to be uh, put on the market, as in brought into use, uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. It's exponential from where we are, and you're living in a part of the world which is actually going to be leading that expansion in the Asia-Pacific uh, area. There is going to be a distinct increase in the number of aeroplanes uh, uh, that are flying around, carrying passengers to and from uh, their holidays uh, and elsewhere. Um, our, is our airspace ready for that? You may feel down here that airspace is still relatively, and I'm looking for David Morgan probably to agree with me, but relatively free compared to some other parts of the world. I can certainly tell you that the airspace around London, around Paris, around Berlin, around Washington, and I could go on, is certainly not relatively free and is certainly overcrowded today. If this increase in airlines is going to go, are going to, is going to happen, then we're going to have to live through some pretty dramatic changes here in the airspace control as to how we're going to make this happen and free up the space for them to fly. Again, something I believe that our society should be leading the way on and making sure the debate is done based on facts and not on, on, on worry.